according to Carl Truman, we live today in a strange new world. That's the title of his recent book, published last year by Crossway in the United States, and recently translated in Dutch, Een Vreemde Nieuwe Wereld, published by Groen Jongbloed. It's not only the title of his book, it's also the reality in which we live. A strange new world. A world in which boys can become girls. A world in which men can marry men. Because the thing that counts, according to President Biden a few weeks ago, is love. In this strange new world, it only matters whether you can express love in the way you wish. And those who oppose this view are bigoted and hateful. Consequently, this strange new world is a difficult place to live for Christians who love their Bibles and want to live according to the revealed word of God. What we need to survive in this strange new world, besides the Bible and the Holy Spirit, are faithful guides. Guides who can help us to understand our world, see what's happening, what has changed, what we can expect for the future, and who can give us answers to that big question once asked by Francis Schaeffer 40 years ago, how should we then live? According to us, Professor Truman is such a guide, a man who knows and understands the times, and that's the reason we are very thankful for having his book now translated in Dutch. In the introduction to his translation, I wrote maybe one of the most important books in years. Strange New World is a follow-up of a much bigger study called The Rise and Triumph of the Modern Self and gives the essence of the big book, Strange New World. It's more accessible and easy to read. In this way, his important message reaches a much larger audience. The publication of a good book is always a reason for joy. So we rejoice all the more that its author, Dr. Truman, was willing to sit down with us for this video. Dr. Truman, it's a privilege to have you today and ask you some questions. Why did you write this book? What was your motivation? And why should people read it? Yeah, it's a good question. There were a number of factors came into play. Uh, I mean, one, I'd, the, the real book was the bigger book. It's all part of the same project. And so the, the immediate reason for writing the shorter book was to write a book that, as my friend Ryan Anderson uh, said, uh, people would actually read. So <laughs> I wanted to boil the, the argument down into uh, a briefer compass so that Sunday school teachers, pastors, uh, interested Christians uh, could read something, say, on their way to work, that it would just make the, the bigger argument more accessible. The, the bigger question as to why, I, why I've been interested in this subject and why I've engaged in, in this kind of research, uh, I think there are a number of factors uh, in answering that. One, uh, there's a general transformation of the world around us that I think everybody, even if you're not a Christian, uh, will have become aware of, certainly if you're over the age of 40. Uh, when I look back to my studies in the 1980s, things such as freedom of speech, uh, respect for differing opinions. Uh, these were basic to the, the educational system that I went through. It's become very clear over the last particularly 10, maybe five, particularly five years, that old social virtues, freedom of speech uh, being perhaps the most uh, obvious one, freedom of religion being another one, have come under huge pressure. Something's going on in the culture uh, more broadly that even if you're not a, a particularly religious person, you should be able to sort of be pick up and realize things are changing. Uh, secondly, uh, at the time that I got the idea to write the book, I was not only teaching at a seminary, but also pastoring a local church. So I was wrestling with uh, very immediate questions of, of how do I train men for, for ministry to deal with problems that are bubbling up in, in congregations at the moment. And, and secondly, uh, how do I pastor my own congregation? And I was aware that uh, many younger people, for example, have very, very different views about uh, identity, particularly sexual identity, than those that I grew up with. And so the second strand was really wanting me to, to produce a book that would help specifically Christians 
uh, and uh, specifically those involved in, in some kind of pastoral role, whether it's a Bible mm. study leader or a pastor or a counselor, uh, understand why the people that they were talking to and the problems that are popping up within our churches are not necessarily the same as they were when we were younger and don't necessarily operate with the same kind of logic. So it was really that that general cultural question and the more specific uh, pastoral question that was driving the project. So uh, a book that helped people to understand the world in which they live. Does that explain the success of your project? Um, <laughs> <laughs> that I, the the success has completely took me off guard. I had no idea. I, I wrote it for my own interest and, and to try to wrestle through these issues for myself. I had no idea that pretty much everybody else was wrestling with the same issues as well. <laughs> so, and also, of course, the, the 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 COVID crisis, the the problems of 2020 in the United States, the riots, the protests, uh, everything. Uh, brought to, to public attention the fact that, one could put it rather dramatically and say, the old order was passing away right. quite quickly, something new was emerging and, and people wanted to understand it. So, yeah, I may be the only person who's done really well out of all the troubles of 2020, I think. Yeah, so the strange new world uh, <laughs> arrived, which really is uh, neoliberal Western society. Essentially, your book is about changes in perceptions of sexuality and moral behavior. New also implies an old world which was different. Could you briefly paint some of the characteristics of our new world and accent accentuate the strangeness in the light of the history of humanity? Because we've, we're dealing with some pretty weird phenomena. Yeah, I mean, I think there are two... Uh, big ways we can contrast today with, let's say, the world of, of 100 years ago. I think one is we live in a world now where there's a deep suspicion of any kind of uh, traditional, I have to be qualify this, traditional external authority. So uh, the authority of the nation, for example, or the authority of the church, or the authority of the traditional family. All three have been profoundly eroded. Uh, when you think about how uh, patriotism is typically presented by the media or how families are typically presented in movies and in sitcoms, uh, they're typically shown to us now as, as oppressive things. Uh, in, in times past, these would have been the, the external context in which one found one's identity. One would ground one's identity in, in a sense of place a sense of belonging to an organization such as a church. These things have been profoundly eroded. And I think they've been eroded because what we've seen over the last two or three hundred years, really, is an increasing authorization of our inner feelings. And the notion has arisen that anything that curbs or corrals those inner feelings in a direction that makes us feel uncomfortable is therefore uh, oppressive, is making us inauthentic in some way. So I think there's a general story to be told about the the transformation of attitudes towards traditional external authorities that's connected to this rise in influence of, of our inner psychological space. The second and the most dramatic manifestation and, and transformation in our world, I think, is, is attitude to, to sex, uh, sexual activity and sexual identity. One could make a number of points on this. First of all, the very The very idea that we would use our sexual desires or the direction of our sexual desires as a fundamental marker of who we are is historically pretty new. Mm -hmm. Emerges really in the 19th century and is, is supercharged by the reception of Freud's thinking into Western culture. If I could put it this way for the listeners, you know, if we were to travel back to ancient Greece, there's a lot of homosexual activity in ancient Greece, but nobody identified themselves as gay. They didn't grant that kind of authority, that authority of identity, identity to sexual desire in a way that we routinely do. So one of the, the aspects of our new world is we use something like sexual desire. Again, that inner space to identify ourselves. If somebody comes to me in church, a young man comes to me in church and says, uh, Reverend Truman, uh, I'm gay. They're not necessarily telling me about anything they've done they're telling me about something they feel. And that's a new attitude to, to sexual 
uh, desire that's emerged uh, in the West. And, and secondly, when we're thinking about the sexual revolution, we, we moved as a culture more or less to a position where we no longer think that sexual acts in themselves have intrinsic moral value. It's the context. You know, if you, if you think of how the Bible uh, sets out sex, some acts, uh, I won't mention them for your listeners, but, but I'm sure you, you know the ones I'm, I, I'm referring to, some sexual acts are always wrong, regardless of what context they occur in. We might say adultery is always wrong. It doesn't matter if the man and the wife involved in this act are consenting to it. It's always wrong. It's intrinsically wrong. Homosexuality is always wrong in the Bible. It doesn't matter if the parties are consenting. There's something intrinsic to the act itself that makes it wrong. We now live in a world where that simply isn't the case. Uh, by and large, we regard sexual acts as, as morally neutral, and the uh, the moral quality that we ascribe to them comes out of typically out of consent. Is somebody being forced to do something they're uncomfortable with or, 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 or they regard as unpleasant? Well, if not, then, then it's okay. When you think about that, that shift in, in how uh, sexual acts are understood, that's not just an expansion of our notion of what is and is not an acceptable sexual act. It's a transformation in how we think of sexual acts at the deepest possible level. And that, I think, again, it perhaps represents the most dramatic change we've seen over the last 30, 40, 50 years, that, that sex has ceased to be morally loaded in the way it traditionally was. Are we still able to recognize uh, disordered desires or not at all? I think so. I mean, I, I think there's, there are things in society that indicate that, you know, I would say, yeah, I'm a big believer, you know, nature has a structure. Nature has a moral structure. And we can deny that and we can bury that. And as Paul puts it in Romans 1, you know, we, we can sort of suppress it deeply, but we can't escape it. And I would say that, that we all instinctively know that sexual acts are actually moral and have a moral seriousness that other acts don't have. And I, I would use, uh, you know, think about law codes. We all know that punching somebody in the face is nasty and unpleasant. It's an assault. In America, in the Netherlands, in Britain, it would be a criminal offense. Unless it takes place on a rugby field, of course. But, <laughs> we won't go there. Uh, but we don't punish somebody who punches somebody in the face as severely as we punish somebody who sexually assaults another. And that, I think, is because even now we know that sexual assault has a profound seriousness to it that is unique. Think of the Harvey Weinstein scandal. Uh, if Harvey Weinstein had been demanding that young women allow him uh, to stick his finger in their ears in order to gain parts in Hollywood movies. We'd regard him as a weirdo creep. But we really, we actually regard him as a monster because he was demanding sexual favors. So I think even in our secular culture, we understand that the morality of we like, you know, uh, the culture tries to tell us that sex is is value neutral, it, it's cost free if you like, but we know. Yeah, it is, sacrality. I mean, yeah, and, and you men are pastors, you, you know that I, I'm thinking of a person in my church when I was a pastor whose whole life had been marked by the fact that her father had committed adultery when she was younger. Um, I think we know that, that sex isn't just a social construct, it actually has an intrinsic seriousness that we can continue to deny. But, you know, isn't it ironic that the hashtag Me Too movement was pioneered by Hollywood, the very place that had told us that sex is cost free? Well, not even Hollywood can live by by their own rules, apparently. A main theme in, uh, in your book is the concept of expressive individualism uh, as an important in, yeah an important characteristic concept yeah. for understanding our time yeah uh, why do you think this uh, is so important to, to to understand 
Yeah. And I'm, I'm thinking a bit about uh, education and the way it filters through from kindergarten upwards uh, the, the past yeah. 15 years or so. Yeah. Well, it's it, uh, expressive individualism is the term I use to refer to what I would describe as the normative self-understanding people have. Uh, and you, you alluded earlier on to sort of neoliberalism, I think. And it's it's very much the, it, the kind of uh, liberal idea of what it is to be a human being. It's, it's not entirely bad, one has to say. I, I think the idea of universal dignity, for example, that uh, that classic liberal thinking uh, pushed was was a very good one and is quite consonant with, with the Bible. Uh, but this idea that ultimately I am what I feel myself to be inside and that fulfillment and authenticity can only be found by me al being allowed to to live outwardly in accordance with my inward feelings. That's problematic on a whole heap of fronts. Uh, first of all, in the most obvious way, it, it lies behind, say, transgenderism today. Uh, when you you hear the interviews with with people who are transitioning, they will typically use language of authenticity. I've been living a lie. I've been playing the role that society demanded of me, now I'm being liberated to be who I really have been inside all along. That's expressive individual language. But it's, it, it has much broader impact than, than transgenderism. Uh, it will tend to make all of us, uh, for example, regard other people as uh, important to us to the extent that they make us feel happy that they allow us to, to live outwardly as we feel inwardly. They will tend to, to encourage us to think of, of all human relations, therefore, as kind of contractual. Uh, one obvious example would be uh, the way we think of marriage today. I, I don't know what the marriage laws are in the Netherlands, but I, I doubt that they're more conservative, any more conservative than they are in the United States. Uh, in the United States, you can get divorced for no reason at all. Uh, we, we call it no fault divorce. And uh, if, if your partner stops making you feel happy, you can divorce your partner. You can divorce your wife or your husband because they're, if you like, failing to fulfill the expressive individualist contract at that point. What's interesting about no fault divorce is it takes no account of the children. Mm -hmm. Children are collateral damage. Uh, the idea that we have natural obligations towards others is something very antithetical to expressive individualism. So this idea that we are who we feel we are inside leads us to think that our lives should be focused on ourselves and on being able to act in accordance with our inner desires. And that has profound impact upon how we think about other people. And obviously that has great significance for the church. Uh, one of the points I make in, I think it's in the larger book about no-fault divorce is, in some ways no-fault divorce has the same logic as gay marriage. Uh, it it, it sidelines any notion of procreation or obligation or telos, and it puts at the center the happiness of, of the people involved. And certainly in America, the church's stand on gay marriage has been profoundly weakened by the fact that the church didn't really care very much about no-fault divorce. Mm. Uh, so the other side of expressive individualism, I think when Christians think about it is, I hope it stops us moving straight away to the pharisaical, we thank you, Lord, that we are not like other men attitude and, and will provoke us to some self-examination about how we've we been affected by this culture. Maybe we don't approve of gay marriage, but maybe we approve of the logic of gay marriage. Uh, maybe there are things we need to repent of uh, as Christians on this front. Is, isn't this really an assault on the first and greatest commandment? Yeah, absolutely. And I think when you think that, uh, you know, how do we define human beings? We define ourselves as, as independent. Rousseau, man is born free, but everywhere he now finds himself in chains. How does the Bible define uh, human beings? Well, we're made in the image of God. Uh, we know that it was not good for Adam to be alone. So there was a social component that need fit in. And then when you come to the greatest commandment, uh, how does how does Jesus say human beings should be defined? They're those who should love the Lord, their God and their neighbor as themselves. In other words, we're to be defined by love, but not self-love. We're to be defined by love that exists in relation 
to others. We are we are social animals on that front and could, should necessarily be defined as such. Dr. Truman, um, a question about the practical value of your book. Um, mm. You are also a minister, a Presbyterian minister, like us. Um, what's the practical value of your book for parents or those who serve in ministry? Um, if my daughter has embraced woke thinking, yeah. perhaps even adopt a different gender identity, yeah. um, how does your book help me as a parent, and as a Christian, as a minister, to deal with this situation? Yeah, it's a very interesting question. On, I mean, you, as pastors, you both know that the, the obvious answer is going to be, well, every situation is slightly different. So it's very difficult to give a, here is a silver bullet that solves the problem for you. But I, I, I would say a couple of things. One, one of the things that, that underlies the book, maybe I don't make it as, as explicit as I should, but one of the things that I press in class when I teach this stuff is, first of all, we need to make a distinction between what I would regard as the, the political ideological movements pushing this stuff and the individuals mm. whose lives are being destroyed by it. We need to be ruthless with the former. We need to, to use uh, all, all the things legitimately at our disposal uh, to oppose gender ideology, etc., as it's being pushed in the public square. But then as pastors, uh, we will come across individuals who've been seriously damaged, maybe by their sexual background, maybe they're just confused by the signals they're getting from the culture. And I think with, with such people, and it may, you know, tragic, it may be your own children. Uh, with such people, one needs to be tender and compassionate. Mm. And Priestly. what I hope my book, mm. sorry? Priestly. Yeah. Um, your book I mean, is prophetic, but. Sorry? Your, your book is prophetic, but it is also a, a, a priestly side. He's referring yes. to the uh, offices yes. of Christ. Yeah. Oh. Gotcha. Yeah. <laughs> yes, yes, yes. Uh, I think we need to, to, to deal compassionately with those right. who are struggling with these kind of things. Um, what, where my book helps there is, first of all, I hope it helps clarify for those of my generation the logic of the mindset of the younger generation. You know, when I was at college, the, you could say to, to a, gay, uh, a gay person, you know, uh, I hate the sin, but I love the sinner because there was a distinction between the sin and the way the sinner thought of themselves. That's not the case no. for young people now. They don't so, understand it anymore. Al al although that s sentence was communicating something good, we love the person and we want to, we want to help them live life in accordance with God's will. Uh, it, it's not going to be a very useful way of expressing that idea. We have to find new ways of expressing mm -hmm. that same good concept. Uh, secondly, I'd say if over the years when I've chatted to, to people struggling with same sex attraction, homosexual temptation or gender, <clears throat> gender struggles, I've not come across any Christian yet who's fully and entirely happy with the struggles they're having. And they don't want me screaming and shouting at them. They want me, first of all, to listen to what they're saying so that I can understand the struggle they're going through and help support them find a better way. And I hope the book allows people to, you know, say, to understand what's being said to them on those points. Thirdly, though, I think, I hope it will make people aware, you, you alluded to President Biden earlier on, that the way the world now uses language such as love uh, is not the way Christians use it. And a big part of our pastoral care of people is helping them understand that when we use this terminology, we have to give it biblical content. Uh, the love is not affirming somebody so they feel comfortable about themselves. Love is understanding what that person has to do in order, I would say, to live life as a God-honoring human mm. being in the presence of God. Uh, so I hope that the book alerts people to the fact that good terminology that we all want to use, love, compassion, etc., etc., has a very different meaning in the world now to how it has you know, for anyone trying to draw their thinking from the Bible. So your advice is basically to 
at a pastoral level, bring them back to God's reality, to His uh, yeah. His will, both uh, as as indicated, revealed from nature. We've lost that yeah. a bit in the in later Reformed tradition, but it's very prominent throughout all church history. And uh, if you jump from uh, a high rise building, uh, you will face the consequences. Yes, uh, and and then also God's revealed reality in Scripture, how He deals with uh, uh, and looks at people. Yeah, there's that's, an apology yes. in, the, in your book for for natural law. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Unfortunately, so many people people are offended by the term natural. I, I I I seriously believe most Christians actually believe in it. They just don't like the term because of. Oh yeah. Uh, well, particularly it's in Dutch the Belgian. It's course. in the Belgian confessions. So, yeah. yeah, yeah. I mean, I would say uh, the way I use nature. I I teach at a Christian liberal arts college, so most of the kids that I come across who ask me questions about this are deeply sympathetic to biblical authority and if they'll come to me and say well what does the bible teach about homosexuality i can point them to the biblical texts and and that and that's compelling for them because they accept the bible's authority but i also know at the back of their mind there's another question lurking and the question will be but why does the bible teach that <laughs> is it just because god is mean and wants my gay friends to have lonely miserable lives And that's where I found actually taking students to some of the health statistics, for example, um, about uh, drawn from secular sources about what an active uh, male homosexual lifestyle does to one in terms of diseases, in terms of physical damage to the body, in terms of life expectancy. And that's not a decisive argument. But I think for Christians who take the Bible seriously, they can then look at those statistics and say, wow, and wow, yeah, it, it really makes sense that God says that. Because what God's telling us here is about the structure of, uh, of his world. And if we defy that structure, there will be and are clearly serious consequences. So I've encouraged pastors to be aware of some of the the statistical material it's actually a lot of it comes from catholic sources actually yeah. the catholics are very good at drawing this stuff together um i, I am encouraging pastors to get hold of, of of good statistical material that isn't going to persuade somebody but may well strengthen them in the convictions they have if they're a christian in in many ways, that strange new world that you describe is a, is a man-made construction which is not in line, some would say completely out of touch with the real world as God sees it, uh, following on as, uh, to our discussion uh, just a moment ago. His revelation in nature and scripture. How do you see the future of Europe, the United States, uh, UK? Is there a way back to depart from this strange new world and in some way as society in general get into touch with reality again? If only from a... There's strange contradictions here. If you look on the one hand at the development of Darwinism and some social Darwinism, uh, um, man as an animal... Uh, with biological constructions and objective standards. We uh, Christians don't believe in that, but in theory, uh, scientific society does. Um, this strange new world completely contradicts it and gives us strange allies like uh, Richard Dawkins. Is there a way back and how? Yes, it's it's an interesting question. I, a couple of things uh, come to mind. First of all, I think for the church, uh, we shouldn't be mesmerized by the immediate. We must remember that the promise is to the church. The promise isn't to the Orthodox Presbyterian Church in the United States or to to Dutch Presbyterians, but it's to the church. Our denominations may pass away, but we know how it ends. Uh, The Lamb will be victorious and will be seen to be victorious. So the first thing I say to to Christians is when when we fret about, you know, is there a way back? First of all, don't fret too much. Be a responsible Christian in the place where God has put you Mm. now and trust God's going to bring it all home at the, at the, at the end of the day. Um, secondly, in the general question uh, about, you know, is there a way back? Well, we know that societies do commit suicide historically, and some of them pull back from the brink of committing suicide. Unfortunately, you can't tell which is which until they do one thing or the other. Uh, 
Now, having said that, are there, are there hopeful signs? I think it, it, it depends where you look. Um, I, I'm not very hopeful on gay marriage, certainly in my lifetime. I, I, don't, I think gay marriage is here to stay for the, for the, for the foreseeable future. Uh, transgenderism, though. I think the transgender thing, we're already seeing signs that people are pulling back from, from certainly from some of the massive excesses. Uh, there's been the Tavistock Clinic business in, in the United mm. Kingdom. Uh, even Sweden, of all places, Sweden is becoming more conservative uh, on this, slightly. Ironically, the, uh, uh, as bucking historical trends, as Europe becomes more conservative on this issue, where I live in America, they're full steam. It's becoming more and more extreme at the moment. But I do think that transgenderism, precisely because it involves such a defiance of nature and such horrific mutilation of children, uh, will grind to a halt at some point. When the suicide rate for uh, people who transition and people who don't in, is, is roughly the same, we know that, that the transgender issue is a symptom of a much deeper mm -hmm. issue that biology, you know, physical surgery and hormone treatment is not solving. So I am hopeful on the trans issue that within 50 to 100 years, we will that, that could be consigned to the past. The tragedy is it will only be consigned to the past after countless lives have been mm -hmm. destroyed by it. Because you have to have a critical mass of detransitioners. In America, you have to have a critical mass of people suing drug companies and surgeons. So an awful lot of people are going to suffer. But I do think the trans issue is, is something that we can turn the tide on. A last question, because of the time. Um, in a recent podcast, um, you said you are convinced that the primary calling of the church now is no longer convincing the culture, but to equip and edify churches and Christians. Mm. Can you explain why? Yeah, I think it's, it's a more... I, I'm, I'm thinking in terms, really, I guess, of immediate priorities there. Uh, I am so concerned that the rising generation of Christians are facing such tremendous pressure, on, particularly on the, on the sexual and gender front, that we cannot assume that what for our generation was obvious Bible teaching will be obvious for them. And, and so I think the, the first task of the church is we need to make sure that we are thinking very, very clearly on these issues. It used to be when the broad culture was, I would say, parasitic on Christian values, if you like, uh, we didn't have to worry about the ethics of the broader culture because they broadly tracked with the, the ethics of the church. We don't have that luxury anymore. And one of the things, particularly as Protestants, because I think Catholicism has this long tradition of social teaching it can draw on. Protestants have not done their social teaching uh, well as they should have done. And so I think that the church at this point, we, my, my primary concern is let's make sure that we don't completely lose the rising generation in the, I'm thinking specifically of Europe and North America here in the West, because the pressures to conform with wider society and the pain that will be involved in standing against wider society are such that if our young people are not solidly built on solid foundations, uh, we will see a major, major collapse mm. of uh, the Western church within, within the next generation. What uh, strategies do you recommend practically? Um, well, I, I, I certainly think on the one hand, uh, teaching the whole counsel of God, it sounds, <laughs> it sounds like a cliche, but it's actually true. Mm. And, uh, and I think that uh, it's one of the things I, I like about the Dutch tradition, uh, as it was, of... Heidelberg catechism on the Sunday afternoon or Sunday mm. evening, because that meant that you got through the whole, Council the whole of council God. of God on an annual basis. And I think one of the things we see, uh, about the issues we face, you know, gender, sexuality, whatever is we, you can't deal with them in a fragmented way to understand why sex is important in the way the Bible teaches it, you have to understand about men and women created in the image of God. You cannot separate your uh, 
thinking about sex from your theology of creation. So I think as a strategy, first of all, pastors and elders need to think about how do we make sure that we are giving a broad-based account of the whole counsel of God on a regular basis so that as individual issues pop up in the culture, our people have some kind of material to draw on. And secondly, I do think that uh, thinking long and hard about the nature of what it means to say that the world is created and human beings are made in God's image needs to be important. At the Reformation, it was justification. You needed the whole counsel of God at the Reformation, but the particular presenting issue was justification. So you get this, this focus on that or on the sacraments. I think the presenting issue for our day is, what does it mean to be human? What does it mean to be an embodied person? Uh, and we need to be teaching in a way that helps our young people to, to set that question in the context of, of the broader doctrine of God. And I think also we need to be a strong community. Uh, we tend to think as Protestants very much in terms of doctrine, but we also need to be a community uh, because it's communities that shape how people think about themselves in, in intuitive ways. And so the, the uh, it, it sounds like a bad word, but I mean it in a good way, the, uh, the cultic aspect of Christianity, uh, the worship and the being together as the people of God needs to be something we think about as well. Een prachtig boek, een vreemde nieuwe wereld. In het interview dat we net hadden met professor Truman gaf hij aan dat het mogelijk is om als christen te leven in deze vreemde wereld. En om uw kinderen, om uw katechezanten, om uw gemeente daarbij te helpen om daarmee om te gaan. Om weer in contact te raken met de werkelijkheid zoals de Heere God die ziet. Zoals de Heere dat openbaart in de schepping en de regering van de dingen, maar meer in het bijzonder ook in zijn heilig woord. Dus dit boek, Een vreemde nieuwe wereld, dat helpt erbij. Het is uitgegeven door uitgeverij Jongbloed en Bijbels Beraad. Op het scherm ziet u daar straks links die u kunt uh, klikken en lees het.